Welcome to section 5.6b. Okay, general people, we're going to continue our discussion on 5.6. And if you've been reading 5.6, it gets kind of brutal. What your book does is what theoreticians do. And that is they start with first principles or ideas and they see where those ideas lead. And so what they're going to do is they're going to start with these equations and do manipulation, manipulation, derivation, derivation, and combine a whole bunch of equations together to get to some idea. And so this is what your book does. It starts out with a single gas particle, and this is going to be a single particle of an ideal gas, and it's going to put it in this container L by L by L. And then what it does, it starts out with these basic equations. Here's the equation for pressure. Here's the equation for force from physics. And then your book starts vomiting equation after equation after equation at you. So there's all these equations it starts to throw at you. And what I want you to care about is not any of this derivation. You can follow along if you're curious, but what I want you to get to is the end result. And this is the end result of those four to six pages of derivation. And I want to emphasize how they got this particular expression. So this expression that I've boxed right here does not come from experiment. This is a purely theoretical derivation. What I mean by that is someone grabbed a piece of paper and they just started writing idea after idea after idea and they finally came to this conclusion. And this is what science loves to do. It tries to marry theory with experimental data. So what we can do is we can combine these two ideas. So here's what theory said. It says that if I take the pressure of a gas times it by the volume and divide it by the moles of gas, that's going to equal two thirds the average kinetic energy of my sample of gas. Now, a couple lectures ago, we derived the ideal gas law, and that was PV equals NRT. If we rearrange PV equals NRT, we can say that the pressure of the gas times the volume divided by the moles is equal to RT. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and make a substitution. This is the equation that is going to appear on your information sheet. This is the equation I want you guys to know how to use. And I want you to know the implication of this equation. What it says is the average kinetic energy is equal to three halves RT. And so what this means is that the average kinetic energy or the molecular motion of a gas is only dependent on the temperature of said gas. I don't care about the pressure. I don't care about the volume. I don't care about the number of moles. I don't care what gas it is. All that matters when I talk about the motion of the gas or the kinetic energy of the gas is the temperature of that gas. Now, what I should point out is that kinetic energy is usually measured in joules. Now, if it's the average kinetic energy, that's usually going to be joules per mole. Let's go ahead and do a unit analysis on this equation. So if I want joules per mole, I have first the three halves, and that is going to be unitless. Temperature is going to be measured in Kelvin. And then I want to figure out what to use for R. Now, if I look at the units and I want to cancel everything out, well, then I would use 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. That way, the Kelvins will cancel out and I will get joules per mole. So whenever you use this equation, this is the R that you want to use. So let's go ahead and continue our discussion on theory. So a couple of other equations that I can bring together is I can bring that last equation that I showed you guys, plus one of the other equations that I used during the derivation. And I can bring this in and I can get this value right here. 
Now this value right here is the root mean square velocity. So what I can do is I can take gas particles and I can take each particle and I can square its velocity. So this is gas particle one, another gas particle, another gas particle, dot, 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 to the last gas particle in my sample. So I just took all the velocities and squared them. And if I go ahead and divide that, that will get me the average velocity squared or the mean of the velocities squared. So here's my velocities. If I put a bar over anything in science, that means take the mean of whatever's underneath the bar. Now, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the square root of this. And that is going to be the root mean square velocity. Now, again, this is a theoretical value. So if you are a theoretician, this value is important to you. And what we can do is we can calculate this theoretical value. And that, and that is gonna be this equation right here. Again, this is going to go ahead and appear on your information sheet. So let's go ahead and be sure that we can use this equation and do a unit analysis on this. All right, here's our equation for the root mean square velocity. And remember, root mean square velocity is still a velocity. So the units of root mean square velocity is meters per second. Now, three doesn't have any units. So I'm going to just go ahead and leave that blank. And for R, what I want you guys to use is 8.3145 joules per Kelvin per mole. And again, temperature is going to be measured in Kelvin. And so you guys can see that the Kelvins cancel each other out. And then I have to put M, which is the molar mass of my gas on the bottom. Now, I want you guys to be careful here. The molar mass is something that you guys usually express in kilograms per mole. For example, if you guys had argon, you would express the molar mass as 39.95 grams per mole. But in this equation, what you need to do is you need to input the molar mass in kilograms per mole. And so if I were to go ahead and write argon out, that would be this divided by 1,000, or 0 0.03995 kilogram per mole. Now, the reason I want you guys to make that exchange is because if you look on that slide, what you guys will see is that a joule equals a kilogram meter squared over second squared. So again, if I were to do my unit analysis, 8.3145, and I can put kilogram meter squared over second squared. My Kelvin was canceled out. So kilogram gets canceled out, kilogram gets canceled out, mole gets canceled out, mole gets can canceled out. And the only unit that I'm left with is meter squared over second squared. And if you take the square root of that, you get meters second. So to make a long story short, whenever you use this equation, this R is gonna be the 8.3145 joules Kelvin per mole. The temperature always, always make sure you are in Kelvin. And lastly, the molar mass, make sure you are in kilograms per mole to use this equation. All right, gentle people, before we move on, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about an experiment before we get into our next topic. And so here is how this experiment is going to run. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a reaction. And this reaction is going to generate a gas. Now, I'm going to put this reaction in this sealed vessel, which is evacuated. Now in this vessel, I'm going to partition my vessel with these two disks. Now these two disks are also going to rotate and they're gonna rotate at the same speed. So you guys can see that they're turning around real slowly. Now what's going to happen is gas particles are going to come to this first disk. 
Now this first disc is going to have one slight hole inside the disc. That is going to allow gas particles to get to the next compartment. Now, after it goes through this small opening, what it's going to do is it's going to travel and it's going to take some time to travel and then it's finally going to hit the second disc. Now, in the second disc, I'm going to be able to detect that gas. And so remember what's happening. As soon as it leaves this first disc, it is going to travel and take some time, but this second disc is rotating while it is traveling. So super fast particles are going to hit the disc, but if it's slower and slower, the disc has more time to rotate, and so it will hit the disc at different spots. Eventually, the slowest particles will hit that disc. So what I can do is I can look at the distribution of when these gas particles are detected or when they hit that second disc. And what I get out is a distribution. Now what I want you to understand is when I have a sample of gas, not all the gas particles are moving the same speed. Some are moving fast, some are moving medium, and some are moving really slow. The distribution of speeds that I get is shown in this graph right here. And this is a very famous distribution and it crops up a lot in nature. This is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Now here's the equation that Maxwell and Boltzmann came up to describe this very famous distribution. Now don't worry, you don't have to ever use this formula in this class but when you get into your upper division science classes, this will be a very popular formula to use. But let's talk about things that I want you to know about this distribution. The first thing I want you guys to note is the shape of this distribution. What you guys will notice is this isn't a symmetrical distribution. You guys will see that I have a slight tailing at the faster velocity. And then we can go ahead and see what happens when we start changing some of these conditions. Because you'll notice that temperature is in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So let's say that this blue line represents my distribution at room temperature. Now I can go ahead and heat up my sample of gas. When I heat up my sample of glass, I'm going to change the distribution. But here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to take this distribution and simply translate it across. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to pick up the graph and just move that distribution to the right. Instead, what happens is that if I were to increase the temperature by a thousand degrees, I change how many slow particles I have, how many fast particles I have, and how many mid particles I have. However, I still have slow particles. I have just decreased the amount of slow particles I have and increased the amount of fast particles I have. And you can see this if I increase it by another thousand degrees. No matter what temperature I have, I will always have very slow particles in this distribution. I'm just changing the number of those slow particles. When I start increasing the temperature, I'm just increasing the amount of fast particles I have. Now, what you'll also see is I change where the peak is in my distribution. So let's break down some of the velocities that I can pull out of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So the very top of my distribution right here, this is called velocity MP or velocity most probable. This is the velocity that has the highest occurrence. It is given by this equation. Now the next thing you guys will see is this one right here, the average velocity. So it is denoted as UAVG, or like I mentioned before, if you put a bar above some quantity, that means take the average. Again, you see it's not at the tippy top, and that's because I have this tailing, so it's slightly shifted to the right. And then lastly, we have 
the velocity of root mean square. And I already gave you that equation. Now, I will give you each one of these equations on your information sheet. Again, you have to know how to use them. Remember that temperature is going to be always in Kelvin. R, you want to use the one with joules as the units. And M, be sure to use the molar mass in kilograms per mole. Now, again, these are all theoretical constructs. So what I would do in a question is ask, calculate the average velocity or calculate the most probable velocity. Later down the line, you'll see why theoreticians would use these types of values. But let's go ahead and start with some quiz questions. So go ahead and read this question and tell me what you think. All right, so let's go ahead and write down the equation we're interested in. We're interested in the average velocity. The average velocity is going to equal the square root of 8 RT over pi M. So let's go ahead and think about this. So this is all at the same temperature. So T is constant, R is a constant, and pi is a constant. The only thing that's changing here is molar mass. And let's look at the relationship here. What I see by this equation is, is that M is in the denominator of a fraction on the other side. And so what that means is, as my molar mass is going to increase, the average speed is going to decrease. And this is the relationship that I want you guys to take home. The smaller the particle is, the faster it's going to move if all my other conditions are constant. So what I wanted here is the smallest particle or the particle with the least weight, and that's going to be helium. So here is the distribution of molecular speeds for helium, nitrogen, and chlorine. And so if we go off center just a little bit, those would be the average velocity. All right, let's go ahead and do another quiz question. Tell me what you think about this question. Okay, so let's go ahead and write the equation of interest. So the average kinetic energy equals three halves RT. And remember what I told you, the average kinetic energy is only dependent on the temperature. I don't care which gas I have, temperature is the only factor. And since the temperature is the same for all these samples, all these samples have the same kinetic energy. All right, Chem 1A, I hope that made sense. And remember to stay safe.